Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. This event was recorded on the 15th of July 2013, when Robert Song discussed Brave New World, theology, ethics and post-humanism. Thanks very much to Anthony and also to uh, Anthony Morgan and also to uh, Roy for inviting me. Uh, I, I really do see this as just us talking together. It's exploring together. I, I really do not know answers to almost anything that I talk about. Uh, but so it's really just a chance for me to put my point of view and then for you to respond and so on. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please do interrupt. Do shout out. Say what do you mean by that or whatever. I'm, I'm not trying to be obscure at all, and I'm sh- I hope I won't be. But we don't know. Uh, when I'm talking about post-humanism, I'm meaning something like how can we technologically enhance human beings so that human beings are uh, taken beyond their normal capacities. When we talk about uh, bionic man, the $6 million man back in the 1970s, or when we talk about uh, turning uh, the human species, turn, turning homo sapiens from homo sapiens into homo sapiens 2.0. How can we upgrade human beings from what they are uh, to something else? And when we talk about that upgrade, it's just worth noting that even that change of mind to turn homo sapiens from something which is given, a biological given, into something which is homo sapiens 1.0, in other words, something which already needs and points to a kind of sequel, an upgrade. And it's all that kind of area which I want to look at and some of the religious implications of it. Right. What do I mean in, by post-humanism, just in more detail? I want to se- separate out two different kinds of post-humanism. The first is an ideology, and it's an ideology that legitimizes a particular interpretation of our present cultural moment. And the kinds of elements of our present cultural moment that it concentrates on are those which are to do with optimization. How can we optimize ourselves? How can we take ourselves forward? No longer are we content to, uh, to normalize ourselves. We're wanting to improve ourselves. How can we expand? How can we enhance our capacities? How can we enhance our circumstances? And in particular, how can we enhance ourselves? How can we enhance our bodies and minds? In other words, no longer are we about adjusting ourselves to things adjusting ourselves to life, but rather we're saying, how can we adjust things to ourselves? Now, that kind of adjustment can be technological. It can be research-based. For example, uh, biogerontology, biogerontology, that is uh, biological exploration into the sources of human aging, a lot of it done in uh, the university here, that is investigating not just how do we get rid of the diseases of old age, but it's also addressing the question, how can we get rid of old age itself? Okay? Not just the disease of old age, but old age itself. Life extension technologies. How can we make death itself ultimately optional? And again, we all know about technologies for improving our children, design of babies, design of children, and so on. And all those kind of more expansive, uh, not necessarily now, sci-fi options. So those those kind of things. But there's also much more local things, more everyday things. Cosmetic surgery. Numbers of cosmetic surgery operations going up, uh, leaping uh, hugely every year. Mood-altering drugs, uh, Prozac and the like. Those kind of more everyday examples are things which we may know of ourselves and those we know in our friends or in our family. Now, those are the kind of things that one could be talking about, but I'm actually much more interested in the mentality than in any particular technologies. How do we go from healing to enhancement? How do we go from normalization to optimization? How do we go from natural evolution to artificial evolution? How do we go from chance to choice? How do we move from the genetic lottery that we find ourselves with, how can we move to choosing our very bodies and selves? And what I want to look at is what kinds of views of bodies and selves are involved in that move. 
So when I talk about post-humanism, I'm talking about a range of philosophies which actually celebrate what is going on. They celebrate it, they theorize it, they ideologize it, they fetishize it. Those different aspects of contemporary culture that I've just talked about, the enhancement aspects. And uh, the various different kinds of post-humanism that, uh, that come out, transhumanism, extropianism, prometheanism, cosmism, uh, singular singularitarianism, uh, accelerationism, and so on. Uh, if you know anything about the world, uh, you'll know probably of others. And I'm using that word post-humanism post to talk about an ideology which theorizes that cultural moment, just as the notion of postmodernism theorizes a cultural moment which is post-modernity. So that's one kind of approach, an ideology which theorizes it, and it does it in a dominating, uh, if you like, male way of uh, looking how we can conquer our bodies and turn them to better use. Now, that's one kind. There is a second kind, and you might call this post-humanism type two. And this is quite literally post-enlightenment humanism. If enlightenment humanism is about the idea of a self that is centered, that is individual, that is in charge of itself, that uh, goes through the world, is ruled by reason, and so on, that kind of enlightenment view of the self, this, this kind of post-humanism, this second kind of post-humanism, is, uh, if you like, moving beyond that. The individualist sense of the centered self, the self is conscious of itself, and uh, all of these have been moved beyond in different ways, uh, in different kinds of post-enlightenment thinking. So the self as fully conscious and transparent to itself uh, has been uh, questioned by Freud. The self as uninfluenced by society, questioned by Marx. The self as motivated by reason, questioned by Nietzsche, by feminist thought, in fact, by pretty much everyone. Now, there are lots of terms for this post-enlightenment uh, moment, but the term, and perhaps the most obvious one, is postmodernism itself. Now, what I'm interested in particular is not postmodernism in general, but one particular aspect of post-enlightenment humanism, and that is post-humanism itself, as developed by some very interesting uh, feminist writers, uh, technological feminists, often known as cyber feminists, and I'm thinking of people like uh, Donna Haraway uh, or Catholic Catherine uh, Hales. Donna Haraway wrote, wrote way back in the 1980s now um, an article called uh, A Cyborg Manifesto. And although it sounds very science fictional, and in some ways it is, she intended it as a contribution to feminist thought. And it's that which I'm particularly interested in. Now, Haraway is very difficult to uh, read, partly because she's being, uh, partly because she's being savagely ironic uh, some of the time, but also partly because she's also not being uh, entirely ironic. And I take her point to be something like this. Uh, traditional humanism of the Enlightenment kind tends to say that we ourselves, we are rational individuals that somehow are elevated above our bodies. And she's saying, no, we're not elevated above our bodies, we're actually constituted by our bodies. We are our bodies. It's not that we have bodies. We are our bodies. And uh, we don't float above our bodies. We don't take control of our bodies as something which is alien to ourselves. We are our very own bodies. We're biological beings. We're historical beings. We're social beings. And not only are we constituted by our bodies as biological and historical and social beings, we're also constituted by the cultures in which we live. In other words, our cultures flow right through us. So instead of us being uh, like billiard balls, which are impermeable, um, I'm a rock and nothing can touch me, rather actually the whole of life flows through us so that uh, we're very porous selves. We're constituted also by our cultures. And the pitch, bit of our culture that she wants to talk about in particular is the fact that we're a technological culture. And therefore, if we're a technological culture, we ourselves will be in part constituted by our very own technologies. We are, if you like, always already technological. Now, I don't mean just the various ways in which we are technological. And um, there's a very, uh, um, an early cybernetician posed the question, is, uh, think of this as a question, is this, the white stick that a blind person has, is that white stick part of the person or is it a tool used by the person? 
Okay? Is it part of the person, or is it a tool used by the person? Now, the answer to that, I think, is not quite so obvious. And so I think what Haraway is talking about is not just that we are emotionally dependent um, or practically dependent on our technologies. Think what happens when we lose our mobile phone, okay? Practically dependent in that sense. Nor in the sense that we have implants, just as I wear glasses. Some people will have heart pacemakers, other people will have hip, hip replacements and so on. Uh, some have running blades, if you're Oscar Pistorius. But I think she means it, and I certainly mean it, in a much deeper sense than that. That is that human beings are technologically constituted from our very start. We talk about ourselves as homo sapiens. Someone else has talked about us as homo faber. That means the human being that fabricates, that creates, that technologizes. And even if you define human beings as uh, those which go back to the origins of language, what is it to be a human being? It is to be a speaking animal. That itself, if language is a kind of technology, it's a communication technology, does that not itself suggest that we're technological from the moment we have language? And if our brains are large because uh, we have uh, language, it may be the case that we are just thoroughly, profoundly, from the very word go, constituted by our technologies. And what I think Haraway is trying to say is, let's recognize that and let's appreciate it. We are animals and we're animals of a particular kind. And that particular kind for us now is that we're rational, technological beings. If you like, part of our very animality is our technologicality, if I can put it that way, put it um, slightly paradoxically. In other words, there is no big boundary line between human beings and animals, but equally there's no big boundary line between human beings and robots. Okay, so far. Yeah? Okay. Now, what are we doing? What's the difference between these two kinds of post-humanism? The first kind, uh, the dominating self above the body. The second, the self as being constituted by the body. Now, they both have things in common. First, first of all, they're both technophiliac. That is, they both love technology. Uh, they both recognize uh, that we are te technological and they don't want to run away from that. But I think there's a major difference. The first kind of post-humanism is about control, it's about domination, it's about the separation of ourselves from our bodies, it's about freeing ourselves from enslavement to our bodies, it's about being able to replace our body parts indefinitely and according to our will, and so on. The latter approach, the more feminist approach, is about acceptance of and integration with our bodies. As I've said, not that we have bodies, but that we are our bodies. Now, the former kind I see as being an extension of Enlightenment modernity. The latter kind, the cyber-feminist kind, can be postmodern in flavor. I know that you've been having a series of talks on postmodernism. The latter could be postmodern in flavor, but I actually prefer the phrase amodern, that is amodern, non-modern. And I'm following here the French uh, philosopher of science and social theorist Bruno Latour. Um, he says that this kind of posthumanism is not modern, clearly, because it rejects the enlightenment humanist notion of the self as detached from the body nor is it conservative and reactionary anti-modernism, but also it's not postmodernism. And the reason it's not postmodernism is that postmodernism still secretly carries within itself a kind of view of the world which is modernist. That is, it still believes that the past is truly past and can never be recovered. It really believes that we've moved chronologically and uh, ontologically, if you like, beyond modernity, but still keeping that notion of pro human progress within us. Therefore, postmodernism can only ever retrieve the past ironically. It can only ever have, uh, um, it can only have the past as pastiche. It can never have the past as actually true or actually claiming us. And I'm an orthodox Christian theologian, and I actually think the past does claim us uh, in important ways. A little bit more on that later. So I'd prefer to call this um, an amodern move rather than as such a postmodern move. Now, why do I reject the first kind of um, uh, post-humanism, the Enlightenment uh, dominationist version of it? What I want to do is just tell a story about how it came about, because I do think it uh, tells us something very profound about ourselves. 
It is about our deepest intellectual commitments for at least a significant strand of the modern world, not everyone, but a very significant strand of the modern world. And I do think our deepest intellectual commitments are also related to our deepest existential commitments. They're about our deepest hopes and fears, and we find them very difficult to justify rationally or whatever. What I want to do is just go back to the 17th century and just give a way of telling the story of what happened in the 17th century scientific revolution. Philosophically massively important, it shaped the entire way in which we think in important ways. It's why many think that science is the only route to truth, or if you like, that scientific truth is the only truth to be had. It's why many people think that religion is intrinsically irrational, along with ethics, aesthetics, and lots of other parts of human subjectivity. Now, I happen to think that aspects of this move are profoundly flawed, even if I also want to say that we should and must accept many of the huge benefits that have flowed to us from the scientific revolution. I want to talk about the Baconian Project. The Baconian Project is uh, named after Sir Francis Bacon, the great 17th century English uh, statesman and uh, essayist, the person who uh, some people think wrote, in addition to having a full-time uh, job as statesman and an uh, evening job as a philosopher, also wrote all of Shakespeare's plays as well. Uh, Bacon was, uh, he was someone who was very keen to turn the philosophy of the day, which was, he saw as being dull and Aristotelian, he wanted to turn it from abstract speculation to practical benefit. He wasn't interested in philosophy purely as something distanced. He really wanted to know how could it actually help us uh, for life. Now, that's something which I happen to agree with, that particular move. Um, I do think philosophy is philosophy for living, but I don't actually go with the way that he did it. And part of the 17th century revolution, we know the names of Descartes, Galileo, and so on, is a new mathematical conception of objectivity. A mathematical conception of object objectivity which renders everything else merely subjective. Uh, James Watson, the founder of the, or the discoverer of the um, helical uh, structure of DNA, said the only true science is physics, all else is social work. And that's roughly speaking a rather clear um, pronouncement of exactly this. So from the 17th century, for example, we get the notion that colours are secondary qual qualities. Colours are not really real. Now, this is very interesting. And just ponder that for a second. Colours are not really ultimately real. They're not part of the physical universe. They're part of the way that our subjectivity responds to the physical universe. Now, just think of the phrase, all the colour drained out of my life or out of the day or out of the world. And that means that everything that was important about my life or about the day or about the world was lost. Everything important was lost. Now, what the 17th century view of the world is telling us is precisely all that is important about life is precisely merely subjective, not really real. So the 17th century uh, uh, view of things gets rid of the Aristotelian notion of final causes, that uh, the four causes that Aristotle talked about and the notion of a final cause that causes the, um, the, that things can be caused by what they aim at, uh, about the notion of function or purpose, the idea that there is purpose in things, is got rid of. There is no intrinsic function or purpose or design in nature. Nowhere that God could fit in. Nowhere uh, that there can be any kind of spooky or mysterious forces beyond what we can actually observe with our eyes. So Darwinism is constrained by this commitment to no final causes. So you may not use the notion that the heart is there to pump blood around the body because that is a functional explanation. That is a final explanation. The purpose of the heart, you're saying, is there to pump blood around the body. The purpose of wings is to help a bird fly. You cannot, in technical Darwin explanations, use that kind of language. No, those kind of things are simply the contingent outworking of millions of generations of evolutionary process. Anytime we use the language of function, the heart is there to uh, pump blood, the liver is there to do this, and so on. Anytime we use that kind of function explanation, it is actually metaphorical and secondary in nature. Now, I should just say in passing that getting rid of final causes actually gets rid of human beings or gets rid of persons as well. 
There can be no total explanation of things which appeals, uh, which there's no total explanation of things which can actually lie for the idea that people have purposes, that people go around and act for reasons. And lots of neuroscience has precisely this ambition to get rid of the person from our explanation of behavior. And that's very, very straightforwardly coming from the 17th century philosophical view of the world. Now, how long have I got? A little bit. Now, Bacon talks about the notion of maker's knowledge. And this is why I want to talk about the Baconian revolution, because he wants to replace the traditional understanding of knowledge with uh, what he calls maker's knowledge. Previously, all knowledge had been seen as a posteriori. That is, knowledge follows on from the thing that exists. God measures nature, as the medievals put it, God measures nature, and nature measures the human mind. The human mind is always there to be measured by, to follow on from uh, nature itself. And uh, only in the case of small artifacts could we say that we actually measured things, that the mind is the measure of something. So only in the case of a water wheel or a built uh, object or something that we had made, a machine, could we actually say that we had the measure of that in which the object known is the result of the knower's activity. Okay? So uh, the, the thought goes not from nature measuring the mind, but the mind measures nature, the mind creates uh, nature. Now that maker's knowledge, which was only in the medieval world, in the medieval mind, part of uh, uh, small things, small artifacts, that maker's knowledge, Bacon wants to extend to our whole knowledge of the natural world. To know something is not therefore just to know about it, but to know how it has been made, and also importantly, to know how it could be remade. And it has to be said that this pure understanding of knowledge was really only first realized in the 19th century with uh, our growing knowledge of chemistry, and then the 20th century with uh, genetic engineering, and now in the 21st century with things like synthetic biology and synthet synthetic life, and so on. Now, this has huge consequences for us. Everything becomes the potential object of our intervention. The necessary becomes the contingent. And knowledge, and a really important kind of knowledge, has an inescapably instrumental dimension to it. All that we once thought was true is becoming, uh, is becoming ineffable. All that is solid, as Marx said, uh, melts into air. Now, this is an immensely influential con conception. I think you can see it in the philosophy of Kant. I think you can see it in the philosophy of Nietzsche. You can see it in certain lots of con what are called constructivist epistemologies. But it mixed with some really important other strands of thought over the following centuries. In the 18th century, deism, the deist uh, view of um, things, suggests that God is no longer involved in our personal lives. Suffering has no meaning. Radical utilitarianism says that the neighbor's good, love your neighbor as yourself, that that love really is uh, to pursue their felt good, to eliminate their suffering. Romanticism suggests that people should be free to pursue their own individual fulfillment. All of these strands come together in what we now think of as consumerism. And it's led to a consumerist approach to our bodies and indeed to ourselves. The idea is that all suffering should be eliminated not just alleviated, not just uh, got rid of where we can, but eliminated just even in principle, since suffering is intrinsically meaningless. Again, all autonomy should be maximized, not just the good of freedom, but the good of radical autonomy. Therefore, we as human beings, this is what this whole Baconian project, I think, has bequeathed us, we should be free to get rid of anything which we as individuals regard as the burdens of finitude, including any aspects of our bodies that we don't like. And I mean by any aspects of our bodies, not just the blemishes on our bodies that cosmetic surgery can deal with, but also rather larger blemishes like the fact that we will die. Now, just briefly in passing to finish, what's wrong with all that? Now, I'll just say, and this is me being a Christian theologian, I do think there's something profoundly problematic with the naturalism, the materialism, that tends to go with this view of the world. 
It does away with persons, as I've suggested before. It makes the notion of consciousness meaningless. It actually gives no reason at all to think that the universe itself should be governed by laws. It cannot, in any radical exp sense, explain why there should be anything rather than nothing. I think there's a rather large, uh, major set of problems, but I'm not going to concentrate on those now. My concern is rather that the motivations for all of this had an existential basis. In fact, I'd call it a religious basis. In other words, what we saw in the 17th century was not just a neutral defense of the good of science, but actually a religious position. And one can talk about this from Descartes. Descartes, very interestingly, I think, his very famous passage when he says that his philosophy will allow us to be lords and masters of nature. We can make lots of artifacts, but also we can make ourselves healthier. And with the maintenance of health, we will free ourselves from innumerable diseases, both the body and the mind, and perhaps even from the infirmity of old age, if we have sufficient knowledge of their causes and of all the remedies that nature has provided. But more than that, so it's about medicine, great, and um, who will quibble. But interestingly, Descartes goes one stage further. He says, as we all know, Descartes separates the mind from the body, the rays, the rays uh, extends from the rays cogitans. He separates the mind from the body, not just to solve certain problems in the philosophy of mind, but rather with a much profounder purpose. He says he wants to show that the decay of the body doesn't imply the destruction of the mind. He wants to give mortals the hope of an afterlife. Now, we don't normally think of that as being what Descartes was about, but that is actually what he says. In other words, Descartes' philosophy has a very clear moral and indeed existential purpose to relieve us from the bur burdens of the body and to give us religious hope. And I will say that I think contemporary post-humanism of the first kind is actually an extension of Cartesianism. Now, almost all post-humanists, uh, if you go to Stanford, which is the world global home of uh, post-humanism, uh, they will say, of course we're not Cartesians, um, and of course we're not religious. You know, they're profoundly anti-religious, uh, atheists to, uh, to a man, and they largely are men. Uh, but I do want to say that their kind of materialist monism is actually Cartesian in nature. It's based on a Cartesian understanding of matter. All it does is deny that there is a soul. So Descartes says, here's the soul, here's the body. Uh, present post unionism says, there's the body, we just get rid of the soul. But it is the Cartesian understanding of the body that they're working with, Cartesian understanding of matter. And I should say, that post unionism does believe in the soul. It just pretends it doesn't. Okay? And it calls it something else. What it calls is, what it calls the soul, we now call information. After all, one of the great post humanist, body, uh, humanist um, projects is to be able to uh, take all our memories, upload them to a computer. In a few centuries' time, we'll be able to download them again onto another body. Now, what is it that is being uploaded and downloaded? The answer is information. And information is the modern word that we give to the soul. The whole point of information, philosophically speaking, is that it is disembodied. It can be embodied in all different kinds of ways. You can embody uh, information electronically, you can embody it physically in all kinds of ways, but it is intrinsically disembodied. And I do think this, this kind of post is a religious phenomenon. It is based in the fear of the body, it is based in the fear of vulnerability, based in the fear of death. And from a theological point of view, I'd say it has its own understanding of creation, of salvation, and of the future. The creation is just mere matter. It's no longer God's good creation. It is mere matter to be manipulated as we wish. It is fate to be escaped from. And salvation is the use of technology to help us to escape that fate. The future, uh, in Christian theological terms, is eschatology. It's understanding of the last things. The future post-humanism is one of limitless, expansive possibility. And I have said that is truthfully a future that is genuinely fantastic. That is, it is genuinely fantasy-based. And I just wish they'd fess up and just say, yep, we are religious um, and we'll be honest about it. But that's the last thing they're going to do. Now, why do I prefer the cyber-feminist approach? 
Well, as I've said, I'm an Orthodox Christian theology, theologian, and I know that Christian theology has often, and I think rightly, been seen as in part as being against the body. Think of how Christian theology, or the churches at least, have thought about women. Think about how the churches have thought about sex. And Christian theology has also been thought to be about the disembodied soul. Now, I just think at the deepest level that is just profoundly mistaken and it's certainly very misleading. Christianity's earliest fights were against a heresy known as Gnosticism, the idea that the body could be separate from the soul and that the body was somehow inferior. And the whole point of the church is emphasizing the notion of incarnation, that Christ came in the body, the resurrection, in the creeds they talk about the res resurrection of the body, not just the immortality of the soul, is that it is about affirming our bodily existence. In fact, the church almost entirely, almost entirely throughout all Orthodox early Christian writers, they rejected the trademark Platonic view of the pre-existence of the soul. Plato says, there are souls, as it were, up in heaven, which come down to bodies for a while and then turn up, go back to heaven, and then perhaps come down to another body. Christians always rejected that notion of the pre-existence of the soul. The soul for Christians is more like the life principle. In fact, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest perhaps of all Christian theologians, said, I am not my soul. Really important. Somehow, I think, we need to learn to live with our vulnerability. We need to learn that we will suffer. We need to learn that we will die. And that, if I can put it paradoxically, that learning all of these things is actually part of the good life. And I do think feminist thinkers in general, philosophers, theologians, have been very good on this. Learning to be at home in our bodies. As Mary Midgley has pointed out, uh, post unionists are not very good at talking about children or having children. Somehow, we need to learn our animality, that we are animals. Learn that it doesn't matter too much if it turns out that 98.4% of the human genome is shared with, uh, with uh, chimpanzees, or indeed 50% uh, of our genome is shared with daffodils. It doesn't really matter. Or that the Pinot Noir grape has actually got more genes than human beings. Uh, which I learned recently. So uh, we have to learn and just accept and get on with the fact that we are animals. It doesn't matter too much. It doesn't matter too much, actually, if we can't easily tell the difference between us and machines. Really, in the end, that's, that's actually a modernist fear at the end of the day. It's not a Christian fear. Now, I'm, there are various ways in which I'm not with the cyber feminists. I'm not quite as... Um, Technophiliac as they are, I think they 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 um, get turned on by technology probably slightly more than I think I do. Um, but uh, that's a sort of um, a detailed thing. I'm also for reasons which I think I mentioned earlier. I'm not really postmodernist in the sense that at least some of them are. Um, I actually do believe in truth, uh, which is not a very trendy thing to say. But um, but I'll leave it there. And very happy to have discussion. Capiculture Northeast is supported by Newcastle University, Peels, and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dun City, who host the events.